surrender will never yield. Brace yourself, for the storm is near. We'll stand together, have no fear. Our heritage we will defend until the very end. Welcome to the Haystack. My name is Jonathan Hayes. Today I have Curtis Howe with Scripture, Scriptures Made Simple. And he started a channel a while back. I found it a while back. Um, and this guy, I, I've shown it on previous videos, what his channel looks like. He goes through all these different, every chapter of Scripture. And, and uh, well, you know what, Curtis, I'll let you introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still new at this. That's okay. No, thanks, Jonathan, for having me on here. Uh, yeah, my name is Curtis Howe. Uh, I started the Scriptures Made Simple uh, YouTube channel about almost four, about, it's been about, about four years ago. It was December of 2020 that uh, we launched it, basically. We kind of started putting the groundwork before then, but if I remember, it was December 2020, we actually started to launch it. So 2021 was the first official full calendar year that uh, we were on, but we started releasing in uh, December, if I remember right. Um, but anyways, we I wanted to do something to help people learn the scriptures. So, you know, studying the scriptures is something that is important to me. I'm always studying, always learning, always trying to understand the gospel better myself. So I've read teachings of all the prophets, read the collected works of Hugh Nibley, read a lot of other books and, and things as well to just keep informing myself. How can I better understand the gospel? Uh, and so I, I learned a lot. I've had a lot of people in the past that said, man, I, you know, when I open up my paper scriptures to them, or they, they see, they look over my shoulder in, in Sunday school or something and see my iPad with all my notes and stuff on it. They're like, man, I wish I could read your scriptures. Like you have so <laughs> much, just years and years of, of research of like quotes and thoughts and ideas in your scriptures that, uh, I wish I could just read that and see that. And I thought, you know, why don't I do something about that? Why don't I make this more available for people? And so I thought this would be a, an easy way to get the information out to people is to put it onto YouTube. Uh, so along with the the videos, we do a, when we started this, we actually started along the lines of the Come Follow Me program. Uh, we started with uh, Doctrine and Covenants, in fact. So the first year was just Doctrine and Covenants videos following along with the Come Follow Me lessons. And after that, when we jumped, we were going to go into the next year was the Old Testament for a church study. I decided I wanted to shift what we were doing on our channel and really dig into the scriptures more. So that's when I decided I'm going to release a video per chapter of the scriptures. I started in the Old Testament and have worked through that and I'm now recording actually the New Testament. Um, so, and part of that was, I want to give people a chance to learn the scriptures. I want people to have an opportunity to go a little bit deeper than just the base level, you know, especially in the Old Testament. Most people you get in the Old Testament, you're like, I'm barely figuring out what the story is, let alone what does it mean or, or how can I apply this in my life? So I wanted to make it easier for people to get deeper than just the top level of the scripture, basically. Uh, so with the video, we all the quotes and notes that I have, I put that in the description of the video. So you can copy and paste quotes out and use them yourself. If it's too long for the description, then I have a, a, a blog that I put together and I have a link in there that goes to the blog and has all my notes. So you can see, like pull off, if you're like, oh, that was a great quote. I want to put that in my scriptures. Or I want to use that. You can, you can just copy and paste it off of what I've put out there and have it there for you basically. So um, it's, it's definitely a long time work. Uh, I've gone through, like I said, the whole entire Old Testament I recorded one chapter per video. If you build a habit of watching one video a day, you'll go one chapter a day through the entire Old Testament and you'll be able to finish it. It's, it's uh, granted Old Testament's sometimes boring in some parts. It's like easy to just kind of glaze over it. But I tried to at least talk about some historical factors. What are some other things that are going on with the scriptures to help understand it better? Uh, on top of my own personal study in the scriptures as well, I'm actually working on a master's degree in religious history as well. So I'm kind of, that's this year's edition is uh, adding that to once a week, I'll put a, a video out just talking about what I've been learning in class, basically, so you could follow along with me. Um, but the main part of it is the scriptures, teach the scriptures, made it through the Old Testament. We did the book of Moses and Abraham as well. And now uh, I'm actually recording the gospel of John right now and getting ready to uh, have those released here soon. I, I love that because... Like you said, you're not you're not just making it up and saying this is my interpretation. In this chapter, you're leaving resources and and everything. And I know a lot of members of the church are very 
standoffish when someone goes through the scriptures and, and gives, well, let me tell you what my understanding is. Because this is something that I did for a long time, not knowing what resources were out there. But then this is like one of the things of how I found you was I, I had no background of ancient history except for what I could find, you know. Um, and that was always a huge interest of mine. And I had thoughts or ideas that I had in my mind, but, you know, don't want to share them with anybody because like it, who's going to believe it <laughs> or, or what if it's wrong? People are going to think I'm leading a mystery. And then I hear you sharing something similar and then quoting, you're quoting Hugh Nibley. And I'm like, oh, pretty good. I, I had an idea that Hugh Nibley <laughs> had without that background. <laughs> so it, it was reassuring for me. And then uh, I started listening to your channel more because I'd be driving a lot. And so I like studying scriptures and going through the footnotes. And then I go off on tangents and, and I, I get tangled up in scripture chains. Does this ever happen to you? You just get so wrapped up in, in scripture chain, scripture chain. And you have to thread your way back to the source and like, what was the topic I was on again? I know I wrote it down. <laughs> so I love how organized, concise and everything you are. And in fact, I'm looking at your library right now. And one of the, I can see we have some of the same books, like for example, uh, the human <laughs> yeah. roots of human relations by, was it Stephen R. Covey, right? Yeah. Um, one yeah, of my favorite right books. There. Yeah. <laughs> one of my favorite books, highly recommend um and so there's this is there's a lot of great books out there there's a there's a tremendous amount and and not just from lds scholars either there's lots mm -hmm. of other scholars that are out there as well uh that we can learn from a lot of scholarship in in uh, especially biblical studies so i've i try to pull from different sources even even bring up non lds sources uh to share what are other ideas what are other concepts that we can be learning out there so uh, sometimes I even reference uh, the different versions of the Bible, New International Version, New World Translations, other things that just give perspective of what's going on. The part of the part of the challenge in biblical studies is uh, we tend to believe that our version of the Bible is the version and the only thing that's out there, and we forget the English translation is nowhere close to original of the Bible. The Bible was predominantly written in Greek and Aramaic. And, and Hebrew. And so we don't have, you know, you'd have to go back and study those languages and learn how to speak those languages and read them so that you can go back and see the original. But when we get back into those, we find that there are changes to interpretations in it. Uh, one of the books that I, I have that's been really handy that I do a lot for uh, in my New Testament stuff is uh, uh, Wayman's uh, New Testament Bible. He has a Bible that's, that's, he's gone through the Greek translations and he's talked about them. And so he says, here's, you know, in Greek, that's what this word means. And here's what that, that implies. And that helps us to think about it and go, oh, I can understand this scripture better through the Greek than I can through the English translation. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's part of the challenge that we have is the English translation isn't the best translation of the Bible. It is a translation and it's the easiest for us to read and use because we speak English. That's our predominant language. But when you start to get into it, you see more things. A, a very common one that uh, we see even in the Old Testament is the word virgin that is used in, uh, I believe it's Isaiah. Uh, I don't remember which chapter in Isaiah off the top of my head. I know it's mentioned uh, pretty early on in there, but in Isaiah, it, there's a quote and Matthew references this quote in Isaiah to talk about the virgin birth of Christ. As, as he being born to a virgin was fulfilling prophecy of the Old Testament. And that comes from Isaiah. The, the thing that's interesting in Isaiah is when you look up that word for virgin, we know in our English vernacular that virgin usually means a female who has never had in, had sex at all or anything like that. Uh, and in the Greek word, when you look at the, the Greek translations, uh, they use the same word, virgin. But when you go back to the Hebrew, which, which is even earlier than the Greek for Old Testament, you get a different word. And the word is young woman, not virgin. So a young woman in Hebrew, because of the culture, would have been a typically a, a woman who has never had sex either. But it also could mean a woman that uh, is pregnant but hasn't given birth. So, I mean, there's there's different, you know, when you get the Hebrew, you can see it in different perspectives. It's not just the one one way we think about it. So their meaning is a little different. So it gets us to think different about the scriptures to go, oh, is this is this legit or are we reinterpreting and, or misunderstanding what Isaiah wrote in his uh, book? Was was Matthew just looking at it going, I, I interpret this and I think this is going to be a good fit. So I'm going to add it because Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience and he wants to prove Christ is fulfillment of Jewish scripture, which Isaiah is part of the 
part of Jewish scripture, the Old Testament. So he wants to bring that in, but maybe that wasn't, maybe what Isaiah said wasn't actually a prophecy of a future Messiah, but more of something for his day and age. And, but Matthew just see, interprets what Isaiah said as, I think that's, that would demonstrate Christ again as another example. And so I'm going to use it as well. So it just, it just gets you to think deeper about what's going on in the scriptures and how can we understand more about what's happening in, in at these times, how do we interpret them and how do we make sense of it? And how can they help us in our day and age to understand these scriptures for our, our use? I know a lot of people are <clears throat> starting to use the app scripture notes and I looked at it, it cost money, but <laughs> scripture notes and it lets you cross-reference all the different varieties of scripture all the different translations and has an amazing amount of footnotes that connect and thread everything together and we you know we didn't even have footnotes until what the 70s uh, for yeah. our scriptures so to me i see this as a realistic thing of helping saints come to a better understanding of scriptures and scriptural context because in gospel doctrine or you go to class and Maybe you know something about the history or context that makes the teaching that's being talked about, you know, open up a little bit more and you want to share that, but it's been glossed over and, and uh, you want to share it, but people are like, you know what, we all can't be scholars. And uh, if, if I need to know that the spirit will tell me, and I'm like, but that's not the way the spirit works. I, I, I don't think that's, the, you have to study, search things out. Even Joseph Smith spoke with people who were not of his same faith. He spoke with uh, experts. Uh, President Nelson talks about speaking with a, a Hebrew expert about another translation for Israel is, uh, uh, was it one who lets God pr uh, prevail in his life or allowing God yeah. to prevail. And that's already a footnote and, and part of something, part of our old scriptures. Um, but still it, it shows that uh, I heard one scholar say this recently and, and something I've said. So uh, I'll say it again is um the church doesn't have a monopoly on all truth and information, but it does have a monopoly on authority. And when we look at all these ancient cultures, it's diffusion. You, you see traces and traces of, of the Lord's hand in all these people's lives, a core source of truth, a core source of, of a, a temple teaching, creation story, narrative throughout the world. It's just shrouded in time, uh, apostasy, and changes of culture. Yeah, there's a lot of changes and things that happen in the scriptures that we just, again, we just, we need to, as we try to think deeper about it, most people are going to interpret the scriptures from a standpoint of what am I, you know, what is my present understanding? And uh, in order to, we need to think more about what did it mean back then? How was that interpreted back then? You know, like uh, we have a lot of traditions around the birth of Jesus and the manger scene and the angels and the wise men and stuff. You know, every Christmas we set out the the nativity set, but we don't realize that that nativity set is way more tradition than doctrine. That uh, there wasn't, you know, most likely when uh, we, we don't necessarily hear of an angel appearing above a manger to show people there, you know, there was the star, but the star wasn't necessarily guiding people to a manger necessarily. We hear the, the shepherds coming, they eventually show up at some point, but most likely back then it was a cave that Christ was in. A lot of the times back then, because there's a lot of caves around Jerusalem in the hills, there's a good chance all they have to do to build to build a manger is put one fence up and I can keep all my animals inside this cave, basically. So there's a good chance that Christ was actually born in a cave in the hills above Jerusalem, not in a building, uh, you know, uh, uh, like, a, like a barn or something. We think of it, we think of a manger and like a barn scene today. It was probably a cave back then. And, and you know, the wise men didn't show up till he was about three years old basically. So they didn't, they started their journey about the time of his birth because they were looking at a sign, but they didn't show up for three more years, basically. So there's, you know, there's things like that that you're going, oh, I hadn't realized that, you know, or, or realized that even that uh, in the New Testament, the four gospels, they don't line up with each other. There's contradictions between them. There's some of them reference some things one way and some do it another, like the cleansing of the temple. Matthew and uh, Mark predominantly put that at the end of Christ's ministry, just before, as he comes into Jerusalem is usually at the end, but Luke talks about it almost twice. And then John talks about it as the, towards the beginning of his ministry as well. So was it the beginning? Was it the end of his ministry? Was there two cleansings of the temple? There's three options that we don't have enough information to prove which one's true, but uh, there's, there's little things like that that just get us to think about 
what is going on in these scriptures and how can we think deeper about this? Uh, and that's what I want to do is just help people think a little bit more about what's going on and understand a little bit more context of the scriptures so that they have a better chance of getting deeper into the meanings of what really is there. Uh, and, uh, and and like you said, it's, you know, the, the, the LDS church does not have a, they don't have all the truth. They have more than other organizations do as far as truth is concerned, but they don't have all of it. And so there's lots of opportunities to learn from other other scholars and other groups to say, hey, let's let's understand and think through this a little bit better of what's happening so that we can understand the gospel in a, in a better way. How does this, how do, how can I take an old story that happened more than 2000 years ago and make sense of it in my life today? And that's all we want to do with this is to help, help people build that understanding basically. Yeah. Just like Nephi says to liken unto ourselves. And for me to liken something, I like putting a historical mark on something and understanding the culture, the history, the context. I want to know what diet they're on <laughs> sometimes. And, uh, and, and that's why, like I have the on my featured channels, the types of channels I have are things that uh, are, are contextual, things that are um, help me better understand history and scripture and what even other people think um, their understanding. Because, like you said, we have multiple accounts of the same event held in scripture, and I think that this is uh, not foolishness but wisdom in our early Christian forefathers in preserving a record that instead of saying you know, authoritatively guessing, because it's apparent they didn't know which one was the right one. So they left multiple accounts mm -hmm. and, and uh, allowed for the spirit to guide. And I think that's wise uh, f for all of us to just take into account that, when, like when I look at my, when we look at, sorry, First uh, Nephi chapter five, Lehi goes and starts studying the plates of brass. And what amazes him is that he realizes that he is a descendant of Joseph. And so trying to liken this to myself, I thought, my goodness, when we look at our family history, what are we seeing? We're seeing, you know, our Genesis, our record, our forefathers, but what overall does this teach us? It teaches us that this is how the Lord has, uh, what is it, uh, continued and, and protected and provided for us has preserved us for this day for a restoration event or, or, uh, and now we go in proxy you know, and gather from beyond the veil from the four quarters of heaven in the temple. Uh, I'm of the opinion that it's not from spaceships, but maybe I'm <laughs> wacky for thinking that. <laughs> maybe there is, I don't know. But when I think of gathering from the four quarters of heaven, I think of gathering in from the four quarters of heaven through the temple. And, and these symbols that are used, the, the four images, like the man, the, the eagle, the lion, the bull, uh, these were symbols that were used around the tabernacle as four cardinal directions, not too dissimilar from, you know, the four sons of Horus that are also the uh, four directions, cardinal directions. And it, understanding that history has helped me understand, oh, okay, what's happening in this facsimile, what's being talked about, Oh, it makes sense that Joseph Smith is seeing this, this endowment, this, this anointing, this prayer, all, all these things here, because the ancient Egyptians were after the form of godliness, but lacked the authority thereof, just like Christianity. And I would assume many, many places on earth had forms of godliness without authority. And now it's just bring it back together. And I think understanding history and context allows us to not be so closed-minded and say you're not a prophet i'm not listening to you like i listened to dr david a falk a biblical egyptologist he certainly disagrees with us but i've learned so much contextually and he affirms so much of what i already believe that i wish he understood what i believe <laughs> because then he would realize he's proving things correct <laughs> yeah, but anyways uh this is we can't all be scholars but things like this this channel you know, it, it's not to replace a personal study, but to come in a, as additional. So how might like a, uh, I used to be a seminary teacher in El Paso, Texas. So how might a seminary teacher uh, use your channel? Um, I think one of the things like for seminary, you could use my channel is uh, some of the references that we share in there and some of the different ideas to add some historical context of just, hey, if, if I've got to teach this part of, you know, the scriptures, how can I 
dive in a little bit more. What is it like a unique angle I could use on this? What are some principles or teachings I can pull out of this? Uh, and uh, then you could look through those the, the videos that I've done and find some quotes, find some citations, find some historical context or some other things that might help you to go, oh yeah, this is, here's some great points. Here's some great teachings that, uh, that we can pull together from this. You know, that's, I spend my time studying these things. You know, I follow Jared Halverson's Unshaken podcast and go through his stuff. He's got tremendous stuff. That's another great one to get into. His is different than mine because he's more talking about like the themes and stories in the scriptures and so he's not going verse by verse through it, whereas I wanted to spend more time going through each verse to get a little more granular and to help people. Again, the a big goal of this is to help people become regular studiers of the gospel. If I can help you by releasing one video a day to help you to understand these, then great. You know, if you get in the habit of reading the scriptures every day, it's going to help you tremendously through the rest of your life. So we want to encourage people to do that. We want to encourage a regular scriptural uh, study. And uh, granted, I know a lot of the videos we that I've been putting out on, on the channel are like 30 or 40 minutes. They're not short, you know, little things. Um, but because we have discussion, because we talk about concepts and ideas and, and other things to help us to think deeper about these scriptures. So I wouldn't say that this would re should replace any personal study. I would still do some study on your own, but this can supplement it. This could be, you could either use the, my channel as an opportunity to go through the scriptures. And if you do, you'll see a lot. I know like the Isaiah chapters, 66 chapters of Isaiah, they average 45 minutes each. It's like 60 hours of content just about the book of Isaiah. I mean, that's a lot of content to go through and very few people probably ever make it through all of that. But I'll tell you, if you do, it is going to change your life, what you learn from it. It's very profound what is in that book. And we I bring that up and talk about that. So you can use it as a regular scripture help. I think also uh, use it as reference. Hey, I'm studying this. I don't quite understand this. Let me go look up that video on YouTube and see what I can learn from it. You could do it for a specific reference. So whatever the Come Follow Me lesson is, you can pull those up. Um, in fact, we I've, I've thought about actually building a website that follows the Come Follow Me and then pulls all the videos together in links so you can easily grab them and find clips and, and things about them as we go along um, to just make that a little bit easier to study that way. Uh, right now, it's mainly just getting the videos done, which is hard enough as it is, because there's so much to study and learn and do, uh, and then add to it, you know, in future years as we go along. Uh, and we'll see where that goes. We still got to finish the New Testament, and then I've got Book of Mormon still to do, and probably Doctrine and Covenants as well. And then from there, I have a few options that I wanted to play with at that point, but that's still, you know, another two or three years out, basically, to get all that done. Uh, but that's the goal, get all the standard works done. Uh, and, and, you know, and this is a great resource too, if you if it's somebody who's has a hard time seeing or they can't read, well, we go through it. We discuss it and read it. So you can mm -hmm. learn, even if you can't see or read, you can just listen and follow along with it. So there's a good help that way as well. So uh, so those are the two, I say the two best ways to use it is one, to just go through it as a regular study, to build those habits of study. And another one is use it as a reference tool to just pull it in and go, I need to, I, I've been asked to teach this lesson. I got to teach on the prodigal son. Let's go see what else there is on the prodigal son. And then you can go watch our videos on that and get some more ideas. Uh, so, or, or in Isaiah, you know, I don't know Isaiah, but I'm supposed to teach a lesson on it. Oh, here's a great place. I can go look up quotes and citations and references that uh, can help me to think through Isaiah better. So I try to pull from a lot of different scholars uh, in whether that's, I says, Jared Halverson is a great one that I use. Uh, Dan McClellan, even though he's sometimes controversial, I think he's got a lot of great scholarship in what he does. So pull him in, pull lots of other groups in, uh, again, LDS and non-LDS scholars as well. Um, one of the things that's been interesting in the New Testament is talking about Trinitarian beliefs. What's the difference between Trinitarian and non-Trinitarian beliefs and how does the New Testament relate to those? And so that's been interesting to contrast to just help people who are non-Trinitarian say, look, here's one of the scriptures the Trinitarians use to understand the Trinity with. Here's how they think about it. Here's how they would they would uh, interpret this verse for them. And I also point out for people who are Trinitarians, here's some of the verses that really you have a hard time with when it comes to Trinitarian beliefs because it doesn't. It the, you know if you take this if you take the Bible as literal, this means this verse talks about God and Jesus and the Holy Ghost as different people. So you know we try to bring up some of those ideas to get people to think about it. Uh, the rapture, we talk about the rapture. In fact, Matthew 24 and some of the other references with that as well because the rapture was not 
the rapture is something that was created in the 1800s that doesn't go any further back than that in, in Christian history. And so we don't see that in there. So it's more of a modern interpretation uh, that uh, people have just kind of latched onto and assumed. Uh, you know, even Trinitarian views didn't exist before the second century at the earliest. And so we we have to realize that some of these things that we would think today is core doctrine hasn't been core doctrine for a long time. And they are more later interpretations. And so we need to think about that and go, oh, what does that mean about this? How do I think about it? You know, and and we want to help people to find truth and understand things deeper. Uh, we've done some side courses on Latter-day Prophecy that are on the on the channel as well. Did a whole course on uh, Articles of Faith that uh, we've talked about. I'm going to probably do some updated stuff on that uh, as well because my I have a graduate class right now and I'm for my research paper, I'm studying the history of the Articles of Faith and doing more with that, more of a reception history. Um to just broaden it out too, to give people more advice, more more tips. When it comes to especially like Latter-day Prophecy, there's so much that gets it wrong. Most most stuff out there gets it wrong more than it gets it right. And uh, people struggle sometimes with that. And so we want to just give some more perspectives and go, guys, this is, you know, people are talking about like last day stuff. And it's like, that's, that's, that's like, that was only, you know, we haven't talked about it for that long. That's not, that's just a local modern interpretation. That's not what it really says. To, because there's so much misconceptions around the last days and Latter-day Prophecy. We tried to answer a few of those questions uh, as well to help people think through that a little bit better. So that's that's the point of it, is to just help make it easier for people to find information and to learn, to get into the scholarship. And the beauty is, is you don't have to spend the bazillions of hours that I've spent reading books and studying and learning and going through this. The channel pulls a lot of it together for you to make it easier for you to go, oh, here's a bunch of stuff in one place that I can go to to learn. And uh, that's what we try to do, basically, is provide different perspectives and views, provide opportunities for people to really start to dive deeper and want to study deeper the scriptures and get into them more and realize that there's such a bigger world out there of opportunity to study that uh, that it's important for them to get into. Well, I know a lot of my audience is 65 and older. And, you know, from ministering here in town, I, I could tell a lot of people have trouble uh, seeing, so they have to listen to things a lot. I think that's why people listen to some of these podcasts. <laughs> And uh, so I think this is a wonderful opportunity to do that. Or if you're cleaning the church or you need, you need to brush up on the lesson you're going to give because you left it to last minute. Uh, <laughs> I've even used your channel because BYU has it where they have their instructors come together in uh, the Institute and they go and discuss, but they generally do like chapter one through 13 and they kind of go right through real fast. I'm like, oh gosh, because I had a question about this one part right here and you guys never touched on it. And, and you guys are the ones who I could learn that from. So what do I do? <laughs> However, I found that like when I was looking for a studying, why did Christ have to be nailed to a cross? And the thought came to me after uh, studying in Mesopotamia, how they had these foundation pegs in their temples with the writing of the name of the God and, the, and that it designates that it's God's property and that it's often, you know, put in and, places pins the temple down as god's property on the earth and that's what it's for and i'm like oh my gosh that kind of reminds me of something <laughs> and, and, and i guess as time went on because it was used in ancient egypt and i assume in canaan uh in between there but that same role started being used for um keystones or or even cornerstones that it took on a lot of the same purposes and meanings in later temples but when you go back as far as you can it starts off as a a nail foundation peg and so i looked okay what does isaiah isaiah says stuff about the nail and then you talk about it and so i use some of of what you've talked about and use that so the very interesting things who, who would have known that the nail and, and it's all my opinion that mesopotamia <laughs> carried on through to biblical uh, to the scriptures with isaiah and it meaning something very similar but it, it's it's so coincidental i, I I just want to make note of it for other people to look at themselves, my opinion, right? So I'm grateful sure. that you have all the, the sources available, people to pull from it in your description. And that's that's what we want to do, like you're saying, is get get a little bit more granular with it. Because that's, you know, when, when uh, it was interesting as we started to do the Old Testament videos, uh, we stayed pretty close to, to the Come Follow Me lessons like each week because they were so you know genesis chapters one through six this week and then you know they were really slow 
going through like Genesis and Exodus. And so by the time I was releasing these videos, they were following pretty closely along with what was going on in the Come Follow Me manuals. Uh, the problem was, is when you get past Exodus, they do in the Come Follow Me manuals, they did like two or three chapters in Numbers, and then they kind of skip over Leviticus and Deuteronomy and, you know, do a little bit here and there and then just move past. So we we quickly, like my channel quickly fell behind uh, at the Come Follow Me stuff uh, because I went chapter by chapter through Numbers and, and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And we explain, here's what this talks about. Here's this part of the law of Moses. Here's this story. Here's why this is important. Uh, and so we, you know, and it's not that that's bad that the Come Follow Me lessons that the church is putting out glazes over that stuff. You have to, we have to realize that when we study the scriptures, that there's lots of different ways of studying studying something. Basically, there's different perspectives that can be taken. And uh, that's important. When you study the scriptures, you're not studying everything about the scriptures. Uh, you're just studying a perspective of those scriptures. And so these Come Follow Me lessons are designed not so much to, to teach us the scriptures themselves. They're more designed to help us apply the scriptures to our daily life. And so they think of what are what are modern concepts? What are modern ideas that that we can be reinforcing. So what are things that like these stories could tell us? So, so like we're we're getting moving in uh, next year into uh, Doctrine and Covenants again because we're kind of coming full circle through everything. So next year's Doctrine and Covenants, they're not going to teach the history of the Doctrine and Covenants. What they're going to do is teach how can we apply the Doctrine and Covenants to our daily life. So what are the lessons we could learn as we go through? So it's a just a perspective of it. And they're, the Come Follow Me is about how to apply it into daily life. Whereas if you get into, say, your institute classes, when you get into those manuals, you're going to see more thoroughness in the scriptures themselves, because that's their goal. And so in, in scholarship, there is a term called hermeneutics. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a it's a weird term, I, uh, It's uh, but what it means is, what is the perspective you're taking to study? So hermeneutics is like putting on a different pair of glasses and reading the same book over and over again. It's a different perspective. So you could take a hermeneutics of um, understanding the scriptures from a historical standpoint. You could take a hermeneutics of a theological standpoint of what are the doctrines and teachings. We could take a gender studies hermeneutics to look at things. We could look at, you know, where are women represented and where are they not represented? We could look at all these things. In fact, one of the books I'm reading right now, which is a really good book, is this one here called Proclaim Peace uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Patrick Mason and uh, David Pulsifer put together. It's a re they did this, uh, I think, uh, last year. They put this book out. It's a really good book. It's a hermeneutics of how do we look at the scriptures from the standpoint of violence and peace and the teachings that Jesus gives us. So it, it's the same book, but you're just looking at it from different perspectives. And so that's important for us to always understand. Um, even church history is the same. We're going to see this, uh, it, you know, people complain about church history all the time, and I might do more videos describing and explaining church history. I've done, I have a class right now, America, Mormonism and Early American History, which has been really fun to gain perspective on as well. Um, but people complain sometimes that the LDS church is hiding things because they're not giving a full history. And it's not that they're, they don't want to give a full history, but you, when you read in the Doctrine of Covenants about the position of the historian, when that first became a thing, in, in, when Joseph Smith was around and, and he was told, you need to start keeping the history of the church. You need to start documenting this. The Lord tells him the purpose of the an official history of the church is to promote faith. So their goal is to put out a history that helps encourage people to have more faith in the gospel and in the church. So those are the stories they're looking for when they put that together. When B.H. Roberts did the comprehensive history of the church, that's what he did. He wasn't looking for a comprehensive history of the church literally he was looking for a comprehensive way to build faith in the church by putting these stories together. And so that's why it follows more of the main line. The, the series, The Saints, is the same way. It doesn't tell you everything. They try to, they definitely tell you more than what Roberts put in his history of the church, but it's it's meant to help you to build faith. And so they're going to cut the parts out that would cause questions. They're going to not talk about the disputes. There's a, there's a great book out there actually on the disputes among the apostles. We don't hear about that in church history because again, that's not a faith building story about the apostles arguing over doctrines and teachings and things. Uh, so some parts of church history do get skipped or missed, not because the church is hiding it on purpose, but because it doesn't promote faith. And so there's different ways of looking at the church history. And so you've got to be willing to understand that and go, okay, they want to promote faith. That's their hermeneutic. That's their perspective on it. I want to go beyond that. And so what else can I look at? Well, American Zions is a great book you can get. That's a, it's a church history 
it's it's basically the story of church history from a non faith building perspective basically in fact i i can't remember if the author is a member anymore i think he might have stepped away from the church because of his research into church history uh but his book is a really good scholarly work on how do we if we look at the church from a non faith promoting standpoint we get to see more of the problems that happened in the church. We get to see Joseph Smith make mistakes. We get to see Brigham Young make mistakes. That's okay. That's, that's, it's just understanding what's really there. And we need to be more willing to understand what is really there. Most people have this tendency to learn the gospel from Sunday school. They go to church, they listen to the lessons, they listen to the discussions, they talk with their friends, and that's their perspective of the gospel. And that is a very myopic, and limited perspective of the gospel. When you start to understand the scriptures themselves, you see there's more to them and you want to broaden that out. Uh, most people have a tendency to, and I, I talk about this a lot in my videos, most people have a tendency to learn something and then spend the rest of their life defending the thing they learned. The problem mm -hmm. is, is that means you will not learn truth. Every time you're defending your, your position, you stop learning truth. And so you have to realize that I need to be open to doubt. I need to be willing to admit that maybe what I know isn't 100% the truth. Maybe there's more to this. Maybe I have 35% of the truth and there's more for me to learn, other perspectives to help me look at this from a new way. That's what Alma chapter 32 is all about. When you plant a seed, you have no idea if that seed's going to grow or not. That's the whole point. You're putting it in the ground. You're testing it to see if it works. That is open to doubt. I have to be willing to admit that I might be wrong about this seed. Maybe it'll grow. Maybe it won't grow. I don't know. But until I'm willing to test it, until I'm willing to understand it and work with it and give it a chance, I won't know. And so I have to be open to admitting that maybe what I know isn't the full truth. And so this happens a lot, especially for older members. This happens a lot where you feel like I, the way I've grown up is true and that's the way it is. And then when you start to really get into scholarship and understand the scriptures at a deeper level, you realize what I learned was culture, not the truth. And I need to change that to keep learning. And you start to see things in a different light and realize there's more for me to learn here. And then you keep learning and growing and, and getting better at it. But, uh, you know, I think, um, what was it? Uh, I have a talk sometimes I'll, I'll, uh, that's just kind of fun little talk I've developed recently on getting into the scriptures. And the book of Jonah is a great example of this. You know, most people know the story of Jonah because it's sensational. He got swallowed by a well and then spit out three days later. And that's kind of the story we know. But what we don't realize is when you start to read the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, you realize why was Jonah running away? He was not trying to just, you know, he wasn't like, he wasn't on his way to Nineveh when he got caught in a storm and had to be thrown overboard. He, because from, from Jerusalem, from the Jerusalem area where he lived to where Nineveh was, was a walk. He could get there over land. He didn't have to use a boat to get there. So why was he found sailing west on the Mediterranean? It's because he didn't want to go to Nineveh. He wanted to get to the furthest places away from Nineveh, basically. And why? He hated the Ninevites. Now, if you look at the historical context around... The, sorry, what was that? He wanted them destroyed. He, he was fearful of yeah. them. He knew that, felt that they were wicked and... There, so if, that destruction. <laughs> if if Jonah is a real story and in histor you know, scholars can't prove it's an actual historical story, it could be an allegorical story. But the thing is, is if it is true, because of the time period this is in, there's a good chance that Jonah's family and friends and, and his ancestors were tortured and killed by the people in Nineveh because that's the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And they were not very, they weren't known for hospitality at all. They were very, very uh, negative to people and had a lot of, they, they just weren't good neighbors at all, basically. They're the worst neighbors you could have. So he probably personally has lost people to the Assyrians. He has a personal grudge against them himself. And that could be what was motivating him. And so he realized, God wants me to go call these people to repentance. If they repent, then justice won't be exacted upon them. And I want justice on them. And so he tried to get out of the area. And that's when, and it, it's fascinating because even when the storm pulls up, He's like, oh yeah, I'm I'm kind of denying. Uh, my God wants me to go deliver a message, and I'm kind of hiding from Him. And these people in the boat are like, "What are you kidding me? You're defying a God? Well, no wonder. What the heck?" So they eventually they try to actually get to shore to save him first, and they couldn't because the storm was so bad. So he's like, "Just toss me overboard. God will deal with me." He wanted to die. He would rather drown in the Mediterranean than de deliver his message to the Ninevites. And then when the when he's like, "Okay, you threw me overboard, and I'm overboard," and then the whale comes in. Oh great, the whale's going to swallow me. I'm going to die, and this is all over. 
Awesome. I don't have to deliver my message. And then you got to think about, he's sitting in this well for three days going, any day I'm going to be digested and die. Uh, one of these days I'm going to be digested and die. Hey, I'm not being digested. What's going on here? Why am I not dying? And then he realizes, oh my gosh, I'm actually being preserved. And there's probably more conversation that he and God had, uh, you know, through prayer and stuff where God's like, you got to, I, I want you to deliver your message. You're not dying until you deliver the message. It's like, oh crap, fine. I'll go deliver the message. And what does he do when he delivers it? He, he walks through the town, tells them all to repent. And then he goes and sits on the hillside waiting for the destruction to come against him. And what do they do? They repented. And so that, that story isn't a story of a miraculous prophet. Really, that story is about a guy with a grudge who did not want to do what God wanted. That story has more about Jonah's attitude than anything else. But we don't see that because we don't read the book. We don't get into that story. And then when you start to think more about it, you're going, oh, there's more to this. I didn't realize that. What does that mean from my perspective? You know, God called a prophet that had a personal vendetta, grudge against the, the Ninevites. He didn't want them to be saved. He wanted them to die. And, and so that's interesting that he would call so such an imperfect person to help him. So yeah. we try to bring more of that in there to go, oh, I didn't realize that, you know, there was so much in Jonah and some of the metaphors and thoughts and ideas that were there. You know, people don't even realize in the New Testament that Paul and Peter had an argument. There was an mm -hmm. argument that they had, and uh, Peter was on the wrong side of the argument. He's the prophet. He was the one personally picked by Jesus himself to lead the church, and he made a mistake, and Paul called him out on it. But we don't think about that because we never get past just looking at the verse itself. So that's why we want to talk about these ideas and go, look, let's let's understand historically there's more going on in this than, than just what these words are saying. And so let's kind of shape this. Let's put some more context to this to help you to get into the story and go, oh, I get why that's important. I get why that means something. And that makes it more impactful to my life. And I want to learn more and get more involved in the scriptures. So that's why we have it the way we do. And then there's also collateral stuff that we learn through history. Uh, I, like uh, Dr. David A. Falk, the biblical Egyptologist. One thing he talks about with Jonah is that he's like, no, Jonah more likely, based on the way that they were, were writing that, it's more likely that he actually died and then came back to life. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wow. Uh, three days in the whale, he would have suffocated been dead but not dead dead you know have you seen princess bride he's mostly yeah, dead. yeah. <laughs> yeah. but then getting spit up on the thing and that came to mind because uh my brother you know saved uh, a young man on an outing he had uh run through the water picked up a young man who was suffocated drowning threw him on the back of a, a rock and it, that woke him up and got him conscious he's like no <gasps> and so yeah. And then we also have an eclipse going over Assyria during that time, um, during those years, that more likely than not could have been something that would cause the Ninevites to go, okay, okay, maybe this will soften our hearts too. Not just hearing the word, but we did see the eclipse, so maybe. <laughs> so there, there's possibilities, there, there's things like that that are they recorded historically that we don't, we didn't have, you know, 200 years ago, but today we have that help us. And something that rabbis do, they, they say that uh, the Tanakh, there's 70 layers to, to the scripture. And every time you go through it, you understand something different. You have a different view, a different, different her hermene hermeneutic. Hermeneutics. Hermeneutic. Hermeneutic. View, yeah. View uh, based on things. And this is something that I do is I'll ask somebody what they are understanding from a scripture um, based on what they're reading. And it, in a way, tells me where their heart is or what they're wanting or what they're looking for, because it shows me the lens that they have. I mean, I have family who absolutely hate the church, hate scripture, hate everything. But we'll look at the same passage of scripture and they'll say, well, they'll have a very leftist victimist point of view of something uh, or a very, uh, you, you, you realize that it's the type of mentality that Satan has towards things. Um, or you'll have somebody who simply takes the Christ portion out of it, you know, uh, for an understanding, but then you'll have people who maybe don't understand everything, but what, or from their understanding, it's, it brings them comfort. And so you realize that when we do come follow me, things like that, it's going to a global audience and sorry, the kids are upstairs pounding on the lights in the ceiling. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's going to a global audience and all different languages, uh, young, old, spiritually, adolescent, spiritually, uh, elderly, mature. And so 
it really does come up to us to not be lazy learners, as President Nelson says. And Elder Bettner says, if all you know is what you're told, you'll never know enough. And, and that yeah, exactly is true. We've got to keep learning, you know, and just, and that's what this is for, is just to help people to keep learning. I'm going to keep learning. I've still, I've added more stuff to my scriptures since recording some of these videos. And so I might have to go update things later. It, there's so much to learn. You just got to keep going and uh, applying it. How does this help me in my life? What can I do to understand more truth? There's, we're just scratching the surface on what is possible as far as how much truth there is out there. So it's just, it's just keep going, keep learning, keep improving your understanding and keep living the principles of the gospel, and it'll it'll just continue to help you in your life. That's, uh, you know, the beauty of the gospel is you don't have to be a scholar to be saved. You have to believe in Christ, and that's kind of it, you know, and that's, that's the beauty of it, is you don't have to get into deep sides of it. And if you don't want to, you don't have to, but you should at least keep learning, keep doing more with it. You know, um, Brad Wilcox had a, had a statement he made at a uh, seminar he gave for college students several years ago. And he said in this, in this, uh, in, in addressing that a lot of college aged kids, that's when they start to realize there's more to learn. There's more church history. There's more doctrines, there's more teachings and ideas out there. And that's, that, that's sometimes when they start to question their faith in the, in the church and the gospel because of that, just because they find out there's a lot more than they knew before. It's not that, not that it suddenly opened up. It's just, they didn't have an interest in looking at that. And he said in there, he says, we're not, we're not worried of you studying the church's history we're worried you're not going to go deep enough into the history to find the truth. And mm -hmm. that's the thing that's important is you got to keep studying and learning. You know, if you go an inch deep, but a mile wide, you're not going to get very far. You've got to go deep. You've got to dig into it to really understand what was the context? What did they think? Why was it that way? You know, a lot of people get mad at Joseph Smith because one of the, uh, one of his, his polygamous wives was a 14 year old uh, girl in our day and age, that just sounds outrageous and crazy to have a 14-year-old girl. You know, we would, if that happened today, we would consider Joseph Smith a pedophile. But the average age of marriage in the early to mid-1800s was 14 to 16. It was, the laws, the laws were usually 12 and up, could be married. And so it wasn't an uncommon thing, you know, and a lot of his marriages too, they weren't, they weren't marriages in this world. They were ceilings. And so they weren't legally married. They were only spiritually married married through the ceiling, basically. So it's a marriage that would only take effect in the next life. So that's where a lot of his marriages came in as well. So there's, you know, it, it's, you got to be willing to study and dig deep into it. And, and again, it comes down to, are you really willing to learn the truth or are you just trying to validate your opinion? And that's where we have the problem is people only study because they want to validate their opinion. So they only look just enough to find something that validates them. And then they stop learning instead mm -hmm. of saying, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I need to study more and understand this. And, and I know when, and this is especially important for church members, when they're talking with other people, realize that maybe the other person has some valid points. Maybe I need to study my own church history, my own religion more, because maybe I'm the one that's in the wrong. It's that being open to doubt, being open and willing to keep learning that is important for us to keep doing. And that's how we continue to follow the, the scriptures and, and the gospel and learn more and to, uh, you know, seek the spirit through all that. So uh, hopefully you keep enjoying the channel and uh, going along with that. Like it says, we're, we're doing the New Testament right now. Um, and uh, we'll be doing after the New Testament, we're going to be doing the uh, Book of Mormon, which is a very different book than the other ones. It's going to be different mm -hmm. types of scholarship, different types of ideas, because the old, the, you know, the, the interesting thing is the Bible has tons and tons and tons and tons of information about it. We have, we have, you know, hundreds of manuscripts of the New Testament. We have ancient writings of the Old Testament. We have historical writings of these people from like Mesopotamia, from the Babylonians. We have the, the Assyrians. You know, we have these ideas. We have these, all this knowledge that can help us understand biblical teachings and history better. We have none of that when it comes to the Book of Mormon. There is no book you can read to verify what's in the Book of Mormon, other than the Bible itself, because as it quotes itself, like the Isaiah chapters, or look at the traditions of the Book of Mormon in you know First and Second Nephi, you see a lot of familiar traditions and ideas that still happen in there that show that it's connected to biblical times. But we don't have information about Jaredites or Nephites or Lamanites in any other writing anywhere else that would back it up and say, this is what we do. You know, we can look in, we can look in the Babylonian records. We can look in ancient Mesopotamian records and see interactions with the Jews and Israelite community. We don't have that in the Book of Mormon. And so it's a very different kind of book to study because of that. And so it's going to be really fascinating to get into that book and, and realize we don't, we don't have the historical context. We don't have 
you know, we don't have any other writings in Reformed Egyptian. We don't know what that means. All we have is the English translation of that. We don't even have the plates themselves to compare them to. We have, you know, there. So there's, it's, a, it's a whole different level of scholarship for the Book of Mormon that is isn't quite as the same as what we have in the Bible. So it's going to be really fun to do that book and get into that one here. And it probably it's probably about a year from now we'll be into that book. I think that's why it's extremely important to live a covenant life. Teach our children to do hard things. This is why you claim to be musicians, uh, sports stars, people who devote themselves to hard tasks that they endure to overcome to the next stage is because we're to be as Adam who uh, received covenant. Even if we don't know why we're doing something, we still continue not knowing until that further light knowledge does come and it comes by authority. Um concerning some of these things. This is the way I've looked at, at everything is there must be some form of faith crisis for you to continue to progress. And so when people are so afraid of studying, I say, no, just don't give up. And, and because their lens will start changing, they'll go, okay, now I'm looking at all the bad stuff instead of what came from that, you know? Um, and, be willing to do the hard work. Yeah. And this is what Don Bradley is a good example of this church historian. Um, faith crisis falls away from the church, keeps studying, wanting to know truth because he's dev he, he is earnest in his understanding. And then comes back realizing Joseph Smith is a true prophet. <laughs> and so I think he's a wonderful example of, of that coming from a academic standpoint. But for all of us, we're, we're as Adam and Eve continuing in our covenants, not giving up. Because honestly, if somebody's truly committed to Christ and covenant relationship with Christ, they're continuing in forgiveness, repentance. And it's when people give up on forgiveness and repentance, they start feeling offended and targeting the church and being a victim instead of overcoming and realizing all things have a purpose. And so I want to thank you for, for sharing all of that information. I, I want people to go and subscribe to your channel. I was surprised that your channel wasn't bigger. Your, your channel has every right to be 30 times bigger than mine. <laughs> yeah. So I, I hope people take the time to subscribe, but not just for that, but to focus and listen and learn because it's it, there's worse things out there. <laughs> you, and we need to be as prepared as possible. Allow the spirit to teach you. Allow yourself to learn. So thank you. And uh, anything else? Uh, no, that's it. Appreciate it, Jonathan. Thank you for the time. I appreciate you, Curtis. All right. Bye-bye. I want to thank you for watching the Haystack Podcast. My name is Jonathan. And if you liked what you heard, go ahead and like and subscribe, share it with friends, uh, comment, tell me what your thoughts are. And all the music that you heard at the beginning and at the end is uh, music that I made using Donna AI. So I have a playlist also with the songs I've made, so go ahead and check that out. Thank you.